And so you ready for your start? To start? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, first I'm going to start by giving a, a short definition. And um, I want you to read it here with me with, uh, in the slide. Many have defined school readiness as the developmental stage at which children are ready to engage in and benefit from primary school education. What does that mean? That means that um, a long time ago, well, not a long time ago, but, but um, a school readiness term has been, you know, um, used for, by preschool teachers and to, in order to, to, let know, to, let, to let us know, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, so <laughs> you have to hang in there, <laughs> um, to, to let, um, to see whether the kids are ready to go to school um, according to their age and according to their skills. Nowadays, this term is making a little bit more noise in prim at primary levels because sometimes we have these kids coming from preschool to primary and um, as teachers, we really want to have like this magic thing into our kids and, and say, think that, um, that, they are, that they already know lots of things because just because they are in, in primary. So um, in most parts of the world, uh, eligibility for primary school's entry is determined by age rather than ability. And this is something really important for, for primary teachers to understand. Sometimes the teachers want the kids to do lots of things when they are not able to even, you know, like hold up the pencil correctly or copy from the board because they already, they don't know how to read and write. Um, so it is very important for, for teachers and, and for, for principals to, to understand that children are, uh, in some cases, five years old, six years old, going from preschool to primary, and they have to work on their abilities first. So, um, okay, uh, for kids, if we, if we had to look at, at, at the two people involved here, like children and teachers, uh, when a child is going to start a new school year, he is really excited because he's going to start something new. He's going to use new books. He's going to, um, he's having um, new, new books, new colors, new crayons, new teachers, new classmates, etc. So he's really, really excited. Uh, whereas the teacher is really, really worried because she really needs to know what kind of, uh, what level their kids are going to be. Uh, as primary schools, we have lots of kids coming from different from different schools. We have kids coming from uh, very little kindergartens, or we sometimes we have kids uh, coming from from home. Well, in Mexico, my country, um, kindergarten now is uh, compulsory, so the kids must must have you know like. Um, um, so they they have to be at school before. Um, so starting a new school year is exciting for the kids and for the teachers as well because we know as teachers, as teachers, as primary teachers, we're going to leave um, like a, a print to our kids in terms of, of uh, emotionally speaking, uh, academically speaking, cognitively speaking. Um, schools and teachers need to be ready to receive all different types of children with different developmental levels. We, uh, we know that, that in some schools they are teaching kids to, uh, they're teaching kids to read and write before even they go to, to primary. Uh, when they come to primary schools, some kids, when they, uh, they know how to read and write, it's easier for them to start, you know, with books and everything. And, and for the teacher, we are thinking all the time like, okay, it's my first week of school, I have to start with the program. And it's really, um, it's really important to, uh, to, to, uh, to understand that, that you will have different types of kids. Okay. So um, um, the, the first weeks of school are very important. And uh, I know that, that, that the school year has begun, but it's never too late to start, you know, new things and, and to put things into uh, consideration in your class. So let's see what happens. When, uh, when Kids are, uh, when, when kids start a new school year, they look at the teacher and see, and think what's going to happen, right? And they don't know whether she's going to be a good teacher, a horrible teacher, 
uh, you know, like the Witch of the West, and uh, and they are like like frightened. So the first weeks of school, the kids and and the the behavior is very good because the kids don't know what what to expect. So this is exactly what what we have to start, you know, like getting to know our kids. We have to remember how kids learn, and kids learn by experimenting. And of course, when we talk about experimenting, is they need to know that what we're going to teach in this time, in 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 this case, is um, which is um, English. They have to start speaking in English. We have to understand that kids at this level, they might not be able to produce lots of things. Uh, they will be able to produce. Uh, Short, short sentences or short commands, but not big paragraphs. Um, kids have to experiment the language. How can they experiment the language? Well, by listening to the language. And that's why the teacher has to start speaking in English at all times as possible. Sometimes I know that it's very difficult for the teachers to start, you know, like uh, speaking in a new language, in a foreign language, and, um, and the kids just look at you going like, what is she saying? But, uh, but we have to start doing that so they can experiment with the language. Um, they learn through their senses. We think that sometimes uh, kids, when they are in first grade, they already know how to, you know, how to deal with, with um, the cognitive aspect. But uh, kids need to use their senses. They need to see what you're, what you're teaching. They need to, um, to feel what, what you're teaching. Uh, if you're teaching, for example, uh, a dialogue, and you're teaching um, like uh, expressions, like "Oh my God" or "That's very good," they know that that the language is going to uh, to mean something. So that's why it's important for them to start. You, you have to use uh, you have to use their 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 eyes, their ears, their touch, their everything, all their senses. We have to remember that there are different types of learners. We have the auditory learners, the visual learners, the, the, the kinesthetic learners. Uh, when, they, when they are in first grade, it doesn't mean that they are ready to start the, you know, the, the, the program. So we have to make sure that we have to, uh, that, that our kids are in the level that, that we want them to be. And remember that not all of them are going to be at the same time, uh, at the same moment. Um, Children learn through play. I would say children and and teenagers and adults and everybody. If you're learning, if you if your learning is fine and your learning is is nice, the the learning is going to be there by at all times. If you have a boring session or a boring, which I don't think I, I hope that it's not a boring session today, um, then you start, you know, like. Losing, losing interest in, in what you're saying. So playing is very important. I'm not saying that you're going to play all the time, but what I'm saying is that your lesson should be fun and 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 happy for the kids. We usually we usually hear from our from parents that what the only thing that they want from their kids is to make to to be happy. So sometimes they don't really care about what they learn in in in, in the school as long as they are happy and you know, like uh, getting to know what is expected from them. Kids learn by moving. When we refer to moving is that we cannot have our children sitting down, uh, you know, like reading books. Books are very nice, but, but it's, it's important for us to, uh, to understand that books are just a complement for, for, our, for our teaching. So they need to move, they, they need to move around. And I'm not just talking about first graders, I'm talking about First graders, sixth graders, um, you know, like uh, secondary is kids and everything. Um, when we uh, when we give our kids, for example, um, a lesson, instead of having our kids just repeating and meaningless, meaningless meaninglessly, uh, we can have our kids, uh, for example, um, in uh, in order to to have them words uh, repeated correctly, we can have, for example, a ball. Can you imagine a kid with a ball and then imagine your, 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 your blackboard with all the vocabulary words that you have to teach. And then the kids, uh, they have to repeat the words in order to first, you know, like identify them um, and then uh, learn them. So 
imagine that they are having um, a ball in their hand, one kid at a time, because otherwise it would be a, a disaster in your in your classroom. And you ask them to bounce the ball, and every time the ball bounces, they have to repeat the word. So uh, the kids are are moving, the kids are are repeating, and it's not a repetition, you know, like a a, a boring repetition. And they're starting, they they move by doing so. You can actually have a, as well the kids, you know, like. Um, Giving the, the the ball to the kid and and asking the the kid to throw the ball to the to the to the word and then um, uh, ask them to to repeat the word that they are you know like bouncing on. The kids learn by doing. It's not just that the teacher is going to be everything. The teacher is a guy. The teacher is going to be helping the kids to learn a new language. And when we refer to English teachers or or language teachers. We are referring that we're not just teaching a language. We're teaching developmental things, like, for example, how to uh, hold a pencil, how to wait for their turn. When they come from, from preschools, we have to remember that um, they are kings and queens. And at home, they're kings and queens as well. So when they, when they get to primary, they are you know, a regular kid in the classroom. So uh, sometimes they don't like, they want to um, do everything at the same time. They don't wait for the turns. I don't know what happens in your countries, but in my country, our kids are not very um, eager to wait for their turns. So we have to, to, to start uh, working on that. And um, it, this is something that, that you teach them. It's not something that you, that you just uh, expect your children to, to have. So um, by the, the kids must be involved in their, in their learning. I know that in, in language is a little bit difficult because we have to, the language is controlled and we have to give our, our kids um, uh, certain vocabulary words, certain uh, grammar functions so that the kids start, um, you know, like uh, talking and speaking in the, in the language. So it doesn't matter if they speak, you know, like in, in, in your language, in your native language and in English. It doesn't matter. Little by little, they they will be uh, okay. Um, kids, uh, I was say I was uh, saying about kids learn through imitation and repetition. Uh, they imitate your uh, the way that you're that you're talking. So it is very important for you to have good pronunciation. Sometimes. I've heard in many schools that uh, the, they have the first grade teachers are not uh, very good at the language. They say the only thing that they need to know is um, the farm animals and, and colors and numbers and that's all. And I disagree completely because the, the first grader teachers must be the best teachers ever because they are teaching the kids <coughs> Sorry, they're teaching their kids how to produce the word, how to pronounce the words. They, they're teaching the kids the the language itself. So, if the teacher doesn't have a, a correct language, how can you? How can the teacher expect a child to communicate in, in good English? No. So, um, and sometimes we're not native speakers, as you can see. So uh, sometimes we have pr troubles with grammar. Sometimes we even invent terms of uh, uh, even uh, uh, tenses of, of verbs, sometimes we invent the very past when we say, did he went, for example, that's the very, very past. Or the very present when we say, um, uh, what, did, what, what does he have? But as a teacher, when you're, when you're talking to your kids, you, have to, you must have the, the, the grammar functions correctly. So if you have any problems, we always have in, in our beautiful books, we always have a CD so that you can uh, under, listen to the, to, the, um, to the pronunciation first and then give it to your kids. Don't, don't worry if, you're, if sometimes you're not fluent in the language in, in your classroom. Um, little by little, it will, it will happen with your kids. And if, as long as they hear you talking in English all the time, they will, um, they will want to do it. Um, we have to understand as well that our teachers, our, our students are learning a new language. They're not acquiring that language. When we talk about language, language acquisition, the kids 
by imitating their parents and by imitating everybody around, they are able to start producing a language. Uh, they start imitating, then they start repeating the language, and then finally, hopefully, they they start um, they start actually speaking the language. It happens exactly the same in a, in a new language, and that's why as as primary teachers we have to start to understand whether what kind of level they have, and the first that's why the first weeks of school are very important. So um, kids learn on their own level and by being motivated. As you can see, on their own level is one of the most important things because sometimes uh, we, we might start having discipline problems, not because we have a horrible, a horrible group, but because our kids are not understanding or, be, or because our kids are, you know, like uh, being very, very, uh, very, very, uh, that our lessons are boring for them because they know a little bit more. So we have to understand. We have to um, to great to level our child uh, to assess our children, and um, in order to see what level they are. And being motivated doesn't mean that you are going to be the clown of the class. That means that you are going to motivate them to speak because they, they don't need to speak in the language. They know that at the end of the day you speak in Spanish. Uh, the school where I work in is um, at the, the kids in pre-primary, pre they, they thought that I didn't speak Spanish until they, they heard me speaking Spanish to one of the Spanish teachers. So I had to say, well, she's a Spanish teacher and I have to speak in Spanish to her. And this is something that motivates them to speak to you in English. And of course, they look at you and say, um, "Pero no te entiendo." But it, it doesn't matter because you you are understanding, and, and everything that that they are saying in Spanish, you are you are doing you are rephrasing that in English. So motivate your kids, and if, if we motivate uh, the kids by uh, having wonderful lessons, like having. Uh, fun in the classroom. Fun is, is like an essential thing. If you want your, your kids to, to remember things, you have to do it the M&M uh, technique, which is memorable and meaningful. Sometimes it's not might be meaningful for your kids, but, it, but it's memorable, things that, that might happen in your, in your classroom. No? And on their own level, have you ever been to, for example, have you ever read something that you don't understand? Have you ever had a magazine that you are very, you know, that you are um, interested in, for example, uh, pedagogical topics or teaching topics, and suddenly you start reading the reading the the paragraphs and you don't understand anything because the language is very, very uh, difficult. Well, imagine that it happened to me when I when I subscribed myself to the Newsweek magazine. I started reading the titles and I couldn't even understand what I what the the, the article was about. This is exactly what happens to your to your kids when you give them something that they cannot understand. And and I will be very repetitive in this, but we have to uh, watch for their levels. It, kids are not kids are not the same. They don't learn uh, the same way, and they are not and they don't. Um, reach the same goal at the same time. So we have to, you know, take care of, uh, of that. Some teachers might say that, yes, I have like 32 kids or 25 kids in my classroom. How can I do that? Well, there are lots of uh, different um, things that you can do. You can have like little uh, quizzes that you can have little games so that uh, to see whether your kids are doing uh, fine and they are reaching what you expect them to reach. And the most important thing is in a positive environment. If a, if a kid is not um, learning in a positive environment, then the kids are not going to learn at all. They're going to be frustrated, uh, and um, and they at the end of their studies they will say, "No, nah, I hate English because," and, and and the translation would be, "I hate English because I didn't have a teacher who really uh, wanted me to learn." And uh, a positive environment means that the kids are going to feel comfortable in the classroom with you. They're going to feel comfortable that if they make a mistake, they know that the teacher is not going to uh, make fun at them and that they are going to, um, to learn and be very uh, motivated by the teacher. 
Um, so as teachers, uh, and how can you how can you start you know like doing this in in your classroom? You know that um, a positive environment will always be an environment where everybody can uh, can speak and be heard. When everybody can you know like feel comfortable to say something that they don't like or that they do like, and for that kids need rules and procedures. Everybody needs needs. Um, Rules and procedures, but kinder, um, preschool kids and first grader kids and even sixth grader kids, they need to know what's expected from them in the classroom at all times. So, um, as a teacher, first of all, we have to know what is it that we want to have in our in our classroom. What kind of classroom do we want? I always say my teachers and 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 parents in the school that I work in, um, that. The English classroom is a noisy classroom, but noisy noise doesn't mean, noisy doesn't mean that uh, everybody's doing whatever they want or what that the kids are you know like everywhere and not paying attention to the teacher and being in, uh, and not polite with the teacher. So the kids need to know what's expected from them, and the kids need to know what you want them to do. Sometimes discipline we and and this is. I think this is the key, the key to success. Uh, if you want to really start evaluating your kids, um, if you want to start getting to know your kids, they have to be, you know, in a, in a, in a very uh, not quiet um, stage, but in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pace that they, that they will be able to understand what, what you want. Sometimes. Uh, when we are preparing our classes, we prepare lots of games and lots of contests. And suddenly, when we we are in the classroom, the kids are not able to uh, to do the contest or the games because they're not beha behaving correctly, and they are yelling and they are shouting and they're so we have to give them rules. It doesn't mean that they have to be quiet and you know looking at you all. But it, it means that they have to be respectful, and and um, and they must know what what's expected. You know that discipline is not um, is not taught throughout the, the the school years. As teachers, we think that it's something that that goes every single day, and it's something that you start you know like correcting every single day. But if we taught discipline to our kids, the the, the Classroom management would be so different, and we could do lots of things with with our kids. Let's see one of the of of, of um, the examples that I brought today, and uh, this is what we do. For example, as you can see here, is like a mind map, and in the middle we have a teacher. Okay, this teacher um, is involving the kids to um, to have like uh, like the classroom rules. When we are teaching little kids, we have to understand that we cannot give them like thousand rules to 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 follow. We have to to focus on the on the rules that we want to have and that are important for us to um, to to follow from the very start to the very ending. And that's a very important thing. As a teacher, we have to be constant. If you say something at the beginning, stick to that until the end of the of the school year in terms of discipline. And and if you promise something to your kids, if you promise something like a gift or something, you have to you have to uh, to do it because otherwise the kids are go the kids don't kids don't forget. So look at this for example, and in this way you will be able to see what kind of um, what kind of discipline um, kids you would have. For example, in the middle we have a teacher, and in and the kids will have to say in Miss Angie's classroom, and then. At 12 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, as it was a, um, a watch, you can have like two ki two girls whispering to each other, right? So uh, in the kids wanted to explain through that picture that in that classroom it, everybody spoke in a low voice. So as you can see, the, the teacher is going to involve the kids to make their own rules, and of course, or agreements. Uh, it's not that that uh, it's a rule. But it, it, it's an agreement between the kids and the teacher. 
in order to work fine, right? So the, it's really fun to do, and of course I was telling you that, uh, that it's done in the first two weeks of school, but it doesn't matter. You, it's never too late to do it, so you can do it like tomorrow. And you can start taking photographs, pictures from your kids, and, and involve them to, to, uh, to say, well, the second, the second one, what do you think uh, they're saying when they are raising their hands? Well, of course, it's like in this and this class, I raise my hand if I want to speak. In the third and fourth uh, square, we have kids sitting down correctly. When one of them couldn't even sit down correctly in, in the moment of the picture. And of course, as a teacher, what you do is you're going to, to pinpoint the kids who have trouble doing that rule that you are, um, that you are uh, or the agreement that you want to have. And uh, you're going to use that girl or a specific boy to uh, to picture it, so it's it's here for for you to you know like to call our attention when they're doing something that you don't want. You go and say, oh, look at the picture. You should be sitting uh, down like that. So um, the the other one is we have uh, in that school they have like a circle so that um, the kids will have to do lots of activities in the yellow circle and they have to stand up on the yellow line. As you can see, one of the kids is trying to. Um, to put uh, her feet into the onto the yellow line, and and the other the other square where the teacher is uh, listening to the to the kids uh, is uh, refers to that in in Miss Angie's class we ask permission to leave the room or to go to the bathroom or whatever because that that was exactly what she wanted, and in the last one at like at uh, eleven o'clock or ten o'clock it says in my in my classroom I take care of my material and I put my material where it belongs. So those were the rules that the teacher wanted to highlight. And these kids were, you know, about uh, ending preschool and beginning um, first grade. So um, as a teacher, uh, what we could do and what we could work with our kids is that the first, the first semester we have all those photographs on displayed on the wall or in, in, in a place that you can um, that you choose, and then you uh, you ask every single day to one of your kids to give you the agreements that you had uh, the very beginning of the school year. You can do it in English in in, in the target language or in the mother tongue. It 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 will depend on on your kids. What we want here is that the kids really understand what's expected from them, and that's why we're making pictures and, and words. In the, in the, on the second semester of the, of the school year, what you can do is you have, um, you have your, your, first, uh, your first square at, at 12 o'clock, and then on top of that square you can say, for example, why you do that. So you say, uh, in this and this classroom, we speak in a, low, in a lower voice, because, and then they have to draw a cloud and write the why they want to do that or why they are um, they are asked to do that in every single in every single. So as you can see, as an English teacher, you don't just focus on English or or the language that you're teaching. What you have to focus is on the developmental stages. It's very difficult for the kids to pay attention. It's very difficult for the kids to, f to follow rules. It's very difficult for the adults to follow rules. But for the kids, it's like, well, but if, if, if the teacher doesn't get mad, it, it doesn't matter. So it's very important for us to work with the kids. And by doing so, we get to know the kids what level of, of, of in terms of emotionally speaking, how they are, if they are shy, if they don't want to participate, and little by little we can have them uh, tell them the agreements in the morning. Um, the, se the second semester, as I was telling you, the kids will be able to pinpoint the reasons why they have to, they, they chose that, that specific agreement, okay? I hope you don't have any questions, or if you do, I will know afterwards. Um, for the big ones, now that, that would be, for example, in the first semester. And if you want to highlight different different aspects of, of discipline or or different uh, things in, in your in your class, uh, you can have this type of, of mind maps. For example, you have responsibility. You ask your children to tell you, well, okay, because sometimes we ask you, we talk to our kids and say, you have to be responsible now. 
teachers, first grader teachers expect the kids to be responsible for their belongings. They expect the kids to be uh, to write their homeworks in like in five seconds. So we have to start teaching the kids what we expect from them. I, I know that I'm very repetitive on this, but it's very important. So if we say, for example, here responsibility, what's responsibility in with first graders? Well, you as a first grader, as a first grader, your responsibility is first to bring your homework, no? Like to sit down properly, to uh, whatever you want in your classroom. And little by little, you start, you know, creating a very nice environment in your in your in your classroom. Now, um, first grader teachers, some great first grader teachers. I'm not saying that everybody think that the kids, just because they are seven or because they're just, you know, one year older than in preschool, they will be able to uh, to do things like uh, perfectly, or that they won't forget things at home. And you have to understand that every single kid has a mother and a father behind them at home. So they are going to, to uh, ask from the teachers to be more responsible for their kids. So, and, that, and that's one, one thing about growing up, uh, growing up. It's you are teaching the kids to be responsible, not expecting that the kids are responsible just because they are, they are in first grade. Um, when we now let's refer a little bit about language itself, and when we um, start a, school, uh, a new school year, or we start, you know, with uh, first graders, and we have lots of different uh, kids from different schools, um, we have to um, to see whether the kids know the same things. Now, if we start right right with the with the books, the kids are going to feel frustrated because some kids might not be able to read, uh, you know, fluently, and the kids will uh, will feel frustrated. So, if you have different activities, like for example, um, what the, the 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 most common things that they are taught in in preschool, like colors, numbers, family members, rooms of the house, toys. If you divide those um, those subjects into different like little categories and then start giving activities, games, uh, whether to see the kids are able to um, to hold a pencil correctly or if they are um, actually if they actually know the, the words that you are that they are supposed to, to know. So um, don't we, we we can't rush our kids. We can rush our kids into something that they won't be able to do. We have to teach them everything that we want them to, to perform in the classroom. As, um, as primary teachers, sometimes we think that, that kids don't like to sing and dance and move. As I told you before, where, where the slide showed us about the, how children learn, we have to understand that it doesn't matter what age your kids are. Children love singing and dancing and, 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 um, and rhyming and doing lots of things. So, Give your children the time to sing and dance. Don't think that that uh, that um, as a t as a primary teacher you have to be you know like more formal than than when you were in in than the kids were in, in preschool. Kids need to uh, to find out that they are good at tracing the letters, that they are good at uh, reading little by little, and. The only thing that the only way to, to make your kids uh, understand that is um, when when the kids are you know suc uh, having su um, successful lessons in in, the, in their classrooms. Okay. Now um, I want to talk about as well uh, about development. We have to understand that development cannot be taught or hurried. If a child is forced to perform beyond their abilities. It may damage her, their self-concept or cause negative attitudes about school, and about school and about the the language. Uh, in my case, I hated mathematics, and that's why I studied psychology because I thought that mathematics w was not going to be in my way. And uh, and it was not because that I didn't understand mathematics, but it's it's because I really actually was having. A, a horrible um, time with mathematics because in my case, 
the environment of uh, was not very nice. Everybody was, you know, very harsh. Like I, you don't understand what you do. It like a thousand uh, exercises or problems. So we cannot have uh, if, if uh, we have different um, if we give our children like uh, a, a pat on the back or saying, hey, "Don't worry if you, you're doing fine." Uh, I know that it's difficult for you to start writing the, the homework, but don't worry. Uh, I, I am going to help you, or uh, I'm going to be sitting next to you. The kids are going to feel more comfortable and happier uh, to be in, in first grade, and not just like, oh my goodness, I'm in first grade, and now I, I forgot. I, I, I miss my preschool years. Sometimes I always say my teachers that sometimes from the Garden of Eden, when they are in preschool, they go right to hell because it's really horrible the, the, the difference between uh, the first day in, in primary and the first day in spring primary. So uh, as like a, like as a recap, development is often uneven. Children may develop more quickly in some areas than others, so be sure to prepare activities that engage them as they learn new things. Um, help them to, to learn new things and help them to be um, like open to ask everything that, that, that they, they need. If they are saying things in, in, in Spanish or in their own language to you, don't, don't tell them, no, I don't understand. Just say it in English and, and do it um, and because and, um, otherwise I won't understand. So please don't do that with your kids. There is a tendency these days to do too much, too soon, too fast. Many parents or teachers are falling into the competitive tra uh, trap of hurting children, thinking that it, it is important that the kids should learn to work under pressure, and the long-term effects may be devastating. Devastating, sorry. Children who are pressured may feel stressed and may become burned out by middle school. Sometimes we have these kids at, at um, the third grade when parents come to us and say, "My kid used to like." Uh, English and now she doesn't. My kid used to have good handwriting and now she has a horrible handwriting. And it's because we are hurrying our kids. So remember that the kids do have um, their, their own pace and their own times for everything. And although life is demanding and goes very fast, there are stages of development at every age. We cannot hurry the kids. We cannot ask a kid to start walking before he actually starts um, crawling. We cannot actually uh, ask a kid to start reading before actually uh, start talking. So this is very important. We have to understand this when we are in first grade or, or in first grade of school and in first grade of, of uh, secondary or high school. It's exactly the same. The, the, the transition from preschool to primary that would be exactly the same from sixth grade to, to first grade. Of course, with different aspects like hormones and everything and, and, and adolescence. Um, but, but this transition has to be uh, light. It has to be nice for the kids. And they have to be happy at school learning and, um, and enjoying new learning. And um, I want to finish this, uh, this talk with this thought and um, to just remind you that as a first grade teacher, we are very important. So um, um, remember that children have a lifetime to be adults. So we have to let them enjoy their childhood with playful and interesting and developmentally appropriate activities. Uh, don't rush them. Don't think that if, uh, that if they are in first grade, they can do lots of things that they were not able to do before. Uh, walk with them along, the, along their, their the way and, and try to be very respectful to their developmental level. Thank you very much. OK, Miriam, I've got some questions for you. Um, so one that came through was, when should kids start reading and writing in English? Is it advisable to teach them to read in English at the same time as they're learning to read in their mother tongue? Well, the first question is what, what age? It all depends on the developmental st stage. But um, in English, um, 
I think that it's better for the kids to start reading in their own language first and then uh, start reading in, in a foreign language. It is very difficult for, for the kids to start coding and decoding uh, the, the reading. In English, as we know, we have different sounds and it would be different from, from for example, in, in, in Spanish. A will always be A, but A in English sometimes is A, short A, long A, um, silent A or whatever, no? So I think that uh, the, it all depends on the level of, 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 um, of language that your kids have. They have to start, you know, like if your kids know how to produce a, a, a correct sentence or a correct paragraph, in, in the target language, in English or in, 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 case, in this case, they can start reading, but not reading, you know, like, like un, un meaningless um, sentences, but just what, what they're saying. Something that, that, um, that we do is we ask our children to, to describe something and then we write it on the board and then we ask the kids to, to read it again. And that, that starts, you know, like, like motivating the kids to start reading. So um, I think that, that the best age to read, in my experience, would be when they are reaching the age of six because they already have all the, you know, in terms of, of cognitively speaking, they already have the, the, the letters and the sounds and they are able to hold the pencil correctly and um, they're able to write better. Okay. Um, another question is, how long does it take to correct a mispronounced word? If a teacher has been mispronouncing a word, how should they go about correcting that mispronunciation? And do you think it's helped or hindered by seeing that word written down? Do you think that can help or hinder pronunciation? Well, uh, it, at this level, it's better to start just by listening to the pronunciation and not just looking at the word. Once they already know the pronunciation correctly, then you can use the word. Because um, if, for, for, there are some kids that are very visual, so they need to have like that specific word in order to, to remember the, the sound. Some kids are very auditory. So first, what I would do, because I'm very auditory and kinesthetic, first of all, I would say the, that the kids, that the teachers um, reinforce the auditory uh, aspect of the word and then uh, ask them to, to look at the word. It's very, it's very useful for the kids because they, little by little they will see that uh, English is written in different ways and that it's, it, it's different, it's written in one way and, and pronounced in another way. For the visual kids, it, it's easier for them to, to remember the word and, and say the word afterwards. So um, sometimes when we start repeating words, like, like uh, when, they, when the, some of the kids are not repeating the words correctly and then we start repeating and repeating and repeating the words, sometimes instead of just helping the kids, what we're doing is we're just, you know, like, um, saying, like, like having a, a barrier in front of them. So uh, I would say like three, four times if they, don't, don't, if they are not able to, uh, to produce the word correctly, use it in a chant, use it in a, in a song, or use it. Uh, something, something that I do with the kids is uh, I use, um, you know, like, uh, like a game of pronunciation. So I say, for example, let's, let's hear the word Purple. Purple is a very difficult word. I don't know. For Mexicans, it's very difficult to, to, to say the word purple because this uh, sound is very difficult for us. So uh, every time that, that I say the word purple, I would go like this, purple, so that they understand that the uh, the only way that, that you say the uh is when, when you go with uh, like uh, like you silly you. And, uh, and we, I start repeating the, like I make, I make fun of the, of the sound. So the kids, little by little, will be able to, to produce the uh sound like in circle, purple, turtle, and not saying turtle, purple, and circle, no? Uh, so I think that it's, it's important for the auditory kids to start having this kind of games and for the visual kids to have the, the, the word on the board. And of course, for the kinesthetic, they need to, to write the word in order to, uh, to enhance production. Okay. Another question that comes through is, do you think routines are boring or do you think it's advisable to set routines for primary school children? Very important to set routines. 
but the routines have to be, you know, like uh, active and nice. I'm, I'm not talking about the routines like uh, having your kids repeating uh, the days of the week and the months of the year and the presidents of the of the of the country. It's uh, or you have to the routines must be you know like greeting every time that that uh, that they see um, a new teacher or uh, or every time that they see you that the greetings then maybe a morning song and then little by little to get them into English. I I'm in favor to do routines because the the routines give you you know like um, like a certain security in the in the language. So they know it's like a turning on to English. You come from your you come from home or you come from from um, recess time sometimes, and you're speaking all the time in your own language. So when you you get into the English classroom and you start with the routines, you know it's like like a turning on to to Spanish, to to English. And please, teachers. Their routines must be really, really uh, nice and fun and attractive, and uh, maybe you can you can change not not the routine or, or the the uh, the sequence of the routines, but the way that you make the routine. Okay. Okay. Another question is, how do you deal with hyperactive children in a classroom? <laughs> that's an, that's a that's a very good question. <laughs> um, well, hyper hyperactive kids usually love moving around. So for those kids, I would do I, you would have to do lots of things. For example, um, they, these kids love to play with their play with their hands. They love they love to to have hands on activities. They um, they like to be active all the time. They don't like to be you know like making ditto pages like uh, plan as we say in, in Spanish. And um, we have to make these kids, to make them your helpers, you, the ones that are going to raise the blackboard, the ones that are going to um, to bring the books, the ones that are going to uh, to be like your helpers. For these kids, it's very difficult to be quiet and very difficult to be, you know, um, in in on, in their place. So um, what I suggest is you do like little little exercises for them to, to work um, after they finish. We have to motivate hyperactive kids. They are very intelligent. And the only thing that they can do is to be, you know, like um, quiet and to be uh, not, uh, not active. So what we can, we can motivate them by saying, well, okay, do this, do this chore or do this activity, and then you can do, for example, you can bring a little toy or you can bring uh, um, table game, or you can bring, or you can uh, listen to some music. We have to give them lots of different uh, activities, but motivate them to do what they what they are expected first, and then uh, what what they would they could do. Um, we can have, for example, um, this year in the school that I work in, uh, we're we're going to work with paper with uh, paper bags, so for early workers and usually my hyperactive kids. That if they were if they um, finish their work first, that's very important. You have to not because they are happy or active. You are not going to control them. What you have to do is you have to teach them how to uh, to behave. So um, in these uh, paper bags, we're we're having like different exercises like um, puzzles or rhyming words, beginning sounds, ending sounds. It all depends on the um, on the units that our that our teachers are. And when they finish at the end, at the end of the uh, in the um, in the bag, we have little envelopes, and the kids will have will take the envelope and say, "Well, I did this activity, so I deserve five five more minutes of recess, or I deserve three jelly beans or something." So. These hyperactive active kids will be able to, you know, be working, working, working all the time. We have to motivate them and teach them how to stay still. Very difficult, though, but what it, it can be done. Okay. Um, another question is: What's your view of online um, learning for primary school children? Uh, like what? Like learning through an online environment, an online platform. I think that would be great. Uh, we have to teach them so that they are not nervous when when <laughs> when they have to give a, a webinar. <laughs> but uh, 
I mean, it's it's their life. They are always in this, uh, they are always using screens. And if they if we start uh, remember that that information uh, is now like in two clicks away. So we can motivate the kids to to do that. I mean, to be um, not just with the teacher and to understand that learning and that yeah that learning is not just going to school and being in a room with a teacher who tells you what to do. But online learning would be it would be excellent for for the kids at this age. We we do it with, with little kids as well. When we give them, you know, like little videos that we can that we find in, in YouTube or we can see uh, videos for the kids. We're 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 teaching with with technology and we have to we have to understand that these kids are are Native. I mean, they're technological native. Where I don't know how to say that in in in, in English, but they are native from digital native. digital natives. You know, so we have to use those tools to to bring them um, to school to make it to make it more fun, to make it more meaningful. Meaningful. Okay, I think so. Okay, I've got one last question, and that is um, British or American. Which accent do you think it's better to teach beginners, and should we try and teach both at the same time? Not with little kids. I would. I. I learned the the first English that I learned was British English, and um, and of course, um, United States is very very near here. So uh, I think that I wouldn't teach with these little kids. I wouldn't teach both la both pronunciations. Actually. Well, forget what I said, because actually I'm going to tell you something that I do with the kids, and and this is what I, it's just like a game, a pronunciation game, and I usually um, tell them, for example, what how how it's pronounced in English and British English and, and American English. So, for example, we say, look, this is the word first, 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 British, first, first. And then they have fun doing that. As a game, I would I would do it as a game. I I know that, that sometimes it might sound like a little bit I a joke, um, giving classes English classes, but but it seem it's uh, I think it's important for them to 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 have both um, both pronunciations as long as you are as as you are uh, as your pronunciation is good. <laughs> that's that's that, that's very important. And I would I wouldn't. Teach it formally, but I would you just use it to highlight pronunciation. Use it in international English. <laughs> okay. Um. Final final question here. I'm sorry if I missed your question. We don't quite have time for all of them. Uh, my final question is: Do you think you can combine combine English and Spanish in the classroom with kids who are starting to learn English, or do you think it's a better idea to just do everything in English? If a teacher can, um, I think that it's better to do everything in English when it comes to uh, to the learning uh, subject. When it comes to you know like to being with your kids emotionally speaking, like uh, when they are not feeling comfortable or when they are you know feeling down, your the language is uh, you know it's very important to communicate. I think English must be used at all times in the classroom. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, it's better to use uh, st uh, your native language rather to have both languages at the same time. What what I usually recommend is that you start uh, as English teachers will have to be very histrionic so that the kids understand what what the, we're saying, not because of the words, but because of the way that we're saying or that the the gestures that we, that we're using. And um, what I usually say is that the if you um, if your kids are not, if your kids are not um, understanding you, you have to switch it. Maybe um, when the kids are saying things to you in Spanish, you can rephrase those things in English, and it's easier for them to uh, to uh, to understand that you are understanding. Sometimes the kids want to find out whether you are understanding or not. Okay, so um, yes, I would say. It's it's better to use uh, English at all times. As a non-native speaker, sometimes it's very difficult, and I have to I have to um, to confess 
because sometimes you want to maybe you have to do you want to make something very very clear and then you don't have the words to to uh, to do it so you use your your own language um, I think that children must always need to be you know listening to the to the language that you're teaching so in order to be able to speak it fluently when they are older in my case for example I learned English when I was a teenager I didn't I didn't have English classes when I was a kid I started English when I was a teenager and it was very difficult because of the sounds and everything but I remember that my teachers didn't speak a word in, in, in Spanish and little by little um, you start you know understanding not not everything and all the words but just because of the of context and gestures that your teachers make so yes do speak in, in English <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's it. Just one more thing from me. Um, you can write to help at macmillan.com for your certificates. I've typed that into the chat box so you should be able to see it there. And remember, very importantly, to, re to include the name of the session that you attended in your email um, because they get thousands and thousands of emails for lots of different events. So it's very important to say that you attended Miriam's, email, Miriam's session um, and they will be able to send you a certificate. We will make sure that we keep you posted about up and coming events and webinars and thank you very much for attending. It's been really great to see so many of you here. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Bye.